Washington Journal continues. Marcy Kaptur uh, back on the program, representative of Ohio. Democrat serves the 9th District, and she's also a member of the Appropriations Committee. Good morning to you. Good morning, Pedro. Uh, if President Trump decides to sign this tariff program concerning steel and aluminum, would you support it or not? I am inclined to want to help the U.S. steel industry and its workers. I represent uh, Republic Steel, uh, Alcoa on the aluminum side. Uh, U.S. Steel, in years past, I represented North Star, uh, and of course, ArcelorMittal are all positioned in northern Ohio. This is big business for us. So I want something done to prevent the predatory countries of the world like China, Russia, uh, from interfering in our marketplace. They don't have open markets. They don't play by the rules. But I want to do it in a way that is not harmful. Uh, and therefore, I'm looking for a targeted approach. I'm hoping the administration is moving toward that. What's a targeted approach look like to you? A targeted approach to me would first of all address China. Um, I brought a chart this morning with me that shows that of all the steel manufactured in the world, uh, half of it, that big blue uh, space there, uh, comes from China. They actually uh, manufacture 2,300 million tons annually. The world only consumes 1,500. So they are a major dumper, uh, not just here, but elsewhere, and they distort the global markets. They need to ratchet down their production because they keep uh, interfering with, with free trade. They're not a free trade country. And uh, Russia, uh, in their own way, begins to divert product through third world countries and so forth. So I would treat them very differently than I would treat Canada. Uh, for example, uh, I come from a part of the country, Ohio and Ontario are linked in the automotive and steel industries. So I think, I wish the administration hadn't created so much furor and chaos when they announced this proposal, because I think it has induced unnecessary worry. And I'm hoping that there, um, uh, Mr. Ross, the Secretary of Commerce, knows this industry very well. So does uh, Rob Lighthizer. And uh, they've worked in this industry. Th uh, for a large part of their lives, cumulatively. And I'm hoping that their voices will be ones of wisdom and good measure, uh, not just you know slapping something on uh, that would really distort markets. If something does come into place, there are stories stemming, including this mm -hmm. morning, about retaliatory, potentially retaliatory efforts by other countries. Is this a concern of yours going forward? It's always a concern of mine. Um, the unfortunate part about our country, and I brought another uh, chart there for you to show, uh, we have actually been receiving more imports in steel than exports. And so the net result, that top line, shows how many more imports are coming in here than the bottom line, which shows exports going out. And that gap translates into lost jobs in places like Lorain, Ohio, Cleveland, Ohio, uh, Gary, Indiana, our steel towns across this country. We cannot conduct war without a healthy steel industry. There's something really at stake here. And Mr. Cohen, who left the administration this week, uh, is from Goldman Sachs. He was the head of Goldman Sachs. That is a finance company. They don't really care. Their theory is they don't really care if the steel comes from China or if it comes from Russia. It's steel. Well, those of us who are on the Defense Committee understand that this nation cannot conduct war without steel, domestically made steel. And so there's a defense industrial base issue here. We are down, we've ratcheted down steel production in this country to the bare minimum now. We can't lose it. Uh, our guest with us for about a half hour, and if you want to ask her about decisions on trade by the Trump administration and how it might impact steel and other industries, you can do so on the lines. Democrats 202-748-8000. Republicans 202-748-8001, Independents 202-748-8002. And if you want to tweet us your uh, responses and thoughts, you can do so at C-SPAN WJ. Uh, does it suggest, though, because we do import so much, that the U.S. industry can't produce as much steel as we need? Well, you know, all you have to do is come to Ohio. I invite anyone to come to Ohio and look at the empty plants. Republic Steel has a new arc furnace in northern Ohio and Lorain, Ohio. The most modern you can imagine shut down. They say now that maybe they're going to 
uh, hire a few, uh, few people. U.S. Steel, 700 more people uh, in Lorain, Ohio on layoff. They are my constituents. They are hard workers. They have tried to hold this industry together in a plant that is modern and ma manufacturing tubular steel. But I had the odd experience about uh, a year and a half ago. I was out standing with the steel workers in front of that plant uh, as our country was drenched with imports. And later that morning, I had to go to the port of Cleveland and welcome the first ship. It was loaded with imported steel. I thought if every person in America could see, could see what I'm experiencing, their hearts would go out to these workers as well. Let me tell you, it's not easy to work in one of these plants. Uh, you have to be highly skilled. It's very dangerous. And yes, America needs heavy industry. We can't import ourselves forward. We have to manufacture. We have to make it in America. And that includes a fundamental industry like steel. I represent uh, Ohio. I have major plants uh, such as General Dynamics tank plant in Lima, Ohio, makes the Abrams tank, takes a lot of steel. We have to be able to manufacture that. And you know what? That's the only place in our country that does. It's what's left after this unfair global competition has just battered uh, manufacturing platforms across our country. There's other industries to consider to do this. There's a statement from the American Automotive Policy uh, Council when it comes to the tariffs, and here's what they had to say, saying that we are concerned with the unintended consequences the proposals would have, particularly that it would lead to higher prices for steel and aluminum here in the U.S. compared to the price paid by our original global competitors. This would place the U.S. automotive industry, which supports uh, more than 7 million American jobs, and they also add this as far as their statement from the American Automotive Policy Council, uh, more than 7 million American jobs at a competitive disadvantage. How would you respond to that? Well, I think that they're worried about the just slapping the 25% tariff on everything. <clears throat> and uh, that's why I think the approach has to be more tailored. Uh, I represent more automotive production platforms than I would bet any member that serves in the Congress of the United States. Uh, Ford, General Motors, Chrysler, uh, Fiat, and uh, Heavy Truck, uh, as well as automotive platforms. Uh, this is an ind I co-chair the uh, Congressional Auto Caucus. So believe me, this industry is central to my own heart and mind as I serve here. I think that's where the president did himself a disservice by announcing such a, um, a blunt uh, approach rather than a more tailored approach initially. We hope that we can get to a point where the industry will not be uh, that worried. But even if you purchased a $35,000 car today, which is the average price of a car, there's one ton of steel in that. That's about $135, $140. Uh, over the time of your loan for a car, that is not a lot. Uh, so even if it were to be the blunt approach of the 25%, uh, percent, uh, I think the auto industry has a right to be concerned. Uh, certain parts companies have a right to be concerned, but I'm hoping the president's approach will uh, be a wise one. Did he get any direct input from you, or did anybody in the administration get any input from you? That is where they, uh, well, I'll tell you, last, uh, a year ago, June, I testified over at the Department of Commerce. The Secretary of Commerce, Wilbur Ross, was very open, was very fair, was very rigorous in the testimony that he received. I personally appreciated that very, very much. And uh, we expected a decision last June. We were told it would be forthcoming. Then I think the administration had more internal uh, commotion going on in there, and they didn't come out with a decision uh, or at least an initial proposal until uh, this March. So it's been a long time in coming. And, but Mr. Ross knows the steel market globally very well. He even knew about the plants in my district. I was very impressed with his granular knowledge of what's happening in the steel industry. So I have high hopes. Uh, let's go to our first call. And that is from Ed. Ed joins us <laughs> on our Republican line this morning from Marcy Captor. He is from Lawrenceville, Georgia. Ed, thanks for calling the program. You are first up. Good morning. Go ahead. Uh, good morning. Um, well, um, from all of my observance, it seems like all of the people uh, in the steel unions uh, are actually uh, quite glad uh, what um, President Trump has done. Um, what I would like to ask the representative is, um, you know, for the most part, um, the Democratic Party seems to uh, be against everything that the Republicans do, yet most Republicans, um, you know, we're not hunter-gatherers like your voters. Um, you know, um, like 42 percent of Americans don't even haven't, haven't even saved $10,000 for their retirement. 
And, um, you know... So, uh, Ed, what would you like the Congresswoman to address, please? Well, I would like to say, um, if the uh, steel workers are... Um, well, what I'd really like her to do is um, have be the first Democrat to apologize for slavery. But Let's go to Sue. Sue is in Austin, Texas, Democrats line. Sue, good morning. Hi, Pedro. Um, a quick question for you. Uh, I heard the gentleman give you a hard time once about your name. And then once somebody called you a weird name out of the blue, and you said, my name is Peter, but that's okay. Do you plead for a Peter? No, no I, I, that's not my name. And I, as, to bypass that aside, uh, <laughs> since the guest is here and we have only a limited amount of time with her, Hi, why Marcy. don't you direct our question to, you, to her? Thank you for calling me. I, I believe I've talked with you once before. Um, I'm from Amherst. Oh. Uh, um, are you, is Amherst part of your district? You know what, it used to be, and then when they gerrymandered Ohio so radically about uh, eight years ago, they cut the whole lower two-thirds of Lorain County out of our district, and they extended our district from the heart of Cleveland all across the northern part of Ohio through Lorain, Sandusky, Oregon, and Toledo. So I have parts of a number of communities, but Amherst was completely cut out. However, there are many people who live in Amherst who work in Lorain at the steel plants. Absolutely, absolutely. This is what I wanted to ask, and nobody's actually brought it up at all. Um, a lot of the industry from Lorain has effects on the shipping um, because people don't think about it, but the Great Lakes are a great source of shipping. And what does the tariffs do as far as the the jobs that aren't actual steel jobs but do relate to the shipping of the steel? Okay, so and thank I'll, you. Thank you very much. That is a really good point, how interconnected uh, our production and distribution system is. I represent several ports on the Great Lakes. Uh, we have the Sioux Lock, which is vital to our country's steel industry because a lot of our ore, taconite, comes from Duluth, and then it's shipped down into the mills uh, that exist in Gary and uh, Cleveland and Lorraine. So uh, that's tied together. The rail industry is related to it. We're the fifth largest rail center in the country, and, of course, we have massive trucking companies as well that serve our automotive industry. So we have the most highly industrialized platforms in the country. Uh, in our region. And it's an intermodal mix, a multimodal mix uh, that moves that, that heavy cargo. When people come to our area from other places, uh, let's say, um, I don't mean to pick on southern New Mexico, but I will, uh, and they come to our area, one of the congressmen from down there one time said to me, I said, well, what do you think? He goes, intense. Uh, he has one rail line that served that particular area in his home state. So when they see what it takes to run a great industrial nation. Uh, they are uh, impressed, but it's not been a part of their experience. And that's been one of our problems in the Congress, is trying to convince some of our members that this part of America exists also, and we can't afford to lose it for our industrial and defense prowess. Uh, from Jacksonville, Florida, Independent Line, this is Rich. Hi, yes, thanks for taking my call. My question is, um, with the current uh, atmosphere in, in the White House, when we're talking about uh, cutting into the EPA and bringing back into the steel companies back in there that were big polluters, and my question would be to, uh, do we support bringing this back in with less EPA regulations so that they don't kill off the country, which drove them the high cost of uh, doing business with the EPA drove them out of the country and now trying to bring them back in. Are the EPA restrictions going to kill the country, the land, and the environment? Really good question, sir. I can guarantee you <clears throat> that in places like China, you can hardly breathe the air. We don't want that for the United States of America, and China needs to clean up its own backyard. Uh, so does Russia. But in our country, and the steel executives will tell you this, they have had to meet clean air codes, and it has made an enormous amount of difference in the part of the country that I represent. Nobody wants to go backwards. America is a country about progress, 
about the future and of living with industry in a clean manner. I'm on the Energy Committee, and one of the arenas in which we work very hard with the EPA is to bring new uh, energy technologies into these uh, companies. Um, and you can see it working. The, the platforms I'm talking about have all been modernized. And uh, that's why they have a right to compete in a world where the playing field would be level and that product wouldn't be dumped and uh, at, at rock bottom prices from places where people don't earn a living wage. Uh, so most of these platforms have been upgraded now and uh, they have a right to compete. And that's all we're asking for. The George W. Bush administration puts uh, tariffs on steel for a short period of time. What did we learn from that experience? I think what we learned from that experience is it gives industry a chance to recover. Um, if you look back at the Bush administration and the Reagan administration, when the Reagan administration put tariffs on imports of motorcycles because Harley Davidson was collapsing at that point, after five years they were able to recover. So we saved that industry. It was targeted and it was effective. Um, I think the same can happen in the steel industry uh, if we're careful about what we do and we have dialogue with our trading partners. I assume that's what's been happening uh, inside the White House as this decision has kind of moved uh, fits and starts, fits and starts. We don't have a final document yet with fine print, uh, but I think people are making their views known. I think there's been communication with the government of Mexico, for example, on this continent. And uh, I'm hoping that the administration will make a measured final decision. What does it suggest to you that many Republicans on Capitol Hill are pushing back against this proposal by the administration? Well, you know, there's some people who serve in the Congress who honestly, they represent districts that are um, very different. They're not production districts. They're consuming districts. And if you look at the United States trade deficit over the last 25 years, we have not had a single year where we have exported more than we've imported. And that costs jobs across this country. And some places have been more harmed than other places. We cannot afford to lose our ability to uh, serve ourselves, whether it's in agriculture, and we're a great exporter in agriculture, or whether it's in industry. And um, we don't want closed markets, but we do want reciprocal markets. Japan to this day hasn't opened to our products. They didn't even take Yugos when those were made in the old Yugoslavia. So we don't have a global marketplace that is open. We need to move toward that, not to, toward closed markets, but we've been shooting ourselves in the foot for a very long time, and places that produce have been harmed. So we gotta pay attention. Remember when the automotive industry collapsed? Uh, in 2008 and we had to refinance, uh, that was a real uh, cannonball across the bow of this economy. And if it had not recovered and paid back its federal financing with interest, what shape would this country be in? We would be dependent. We do not want to be independent. We are an independent country. We need to serve ourselves as well as the global market. Representative Marcy Kaptur with us, uh, Jacksonville, Florida next. Rich is uh, on the line, go ahead. Uh, yeah, but I already asked my question pertaining to the the, the EPA environment. Oh, thank you, Rich. <clears throat> Appreciate that. Let's go to then Steve, Blacksburg, Virginia. Good morning. Oh, yes. Uh, I, I saw Marcy on uh, C-SPAN a couple of years ago, and uh, I thought she was one of the most brilliant people I'd ever heard in my life. Wow. And it's like, I wish to God she, I wish she would run for president, but... Uh, You'd be my that, campaign that, manager. <laughs> Uh, well, back to the issue, though, I, I really think that tariffs make just about as much sense or as little sense as more guns in our schools. I mean, it, it's just, yeah, it's stupid. <laughs> What's wrong with them particularly? Well, it's, it's going to hurt American business altogether. I mean, it, it's just like cutting back on solar energy and uh, wind energy so that we can pump more oil out of the ground. It's like we're, we're going backwards. We, we need to be moving forwards. Carlos, oh, well, sorry about that call. I agree with the gentleman about wanting to move forwards. And by moving forwards, we want to produce here at home and not have our companies that are trying to compete globally to be undermined by other countries that don't play by the rules. And uh, we regain market share when we produce here at home at a very competitive price with the highest quality steel in the world, and we export as well as use that product internally. So I agree with the gentleman on the need for progress, 
And I do believe that a short-term application of tariffs, uh, carefully structured, uh, sending a message to those places that are not playing by the rules and dumping globally. Uh, and let me repeat the number. <clears throat> China alone manufactures almost double the amount of steel that the world consumes. When you have that kind of oversupply globally, it snuffs out production in many, many places, including here. We have the most open market in the world. And so we tend to be the dump market for many, many products. And we need to be concerned about our ability to produce, certainly, in a very vital product like steel, which is essential to the defense industrial base of this country. How should Mexico and Canada be considered in these uh, possible tariffs? Well, I think that Mexico and uh, certainly Canada, um, Leo Girard from the, the president of the U.S. Steelworkers has made statements this morning in the New York Times about uh, Canada being a special case because, as I mentioned earlier, we are integrated uh, as an economy. And uh, with Mexico, uh, we have parts companies down there that are shipping into the auto industry. This is why the auto industry is concerned. So I think on this continent, we have to be very careful how this applies. They were not the primary countries that are really not playing by the rules. And so I think that the president's decision best be one that targets those players that are really aberrant, that are, that are not um, conforming to normal global trade behavior. This is Paul in Indianapolis. Hello. Good morning. Hi. Uh, Representative Kapter, I was wondering whether um, our allies in Europe aren't above, aren't some of the biggest abusers, but they're a little bit more subtle about it. They seem to use their VAT as a weapon against us. They uh, take the VAT off of their exports but apply it to our imports, giving uh, giving themselves a about a twenty percent advantage going both ways. Could we? Uh, doesn't that affect steel? And doesn't it affect cars? Doesn't it affect practically everything that Europe sends to the United States and everything we attempt to uh, send to Europe? Yes, sir. I don't know whether China and Russia use the VAT in the same way. I mean, China has a bulge of about 35% on us. Okay, thanks, Paul. Uh, thanks. Very, very good point. Uh, this gets into the complexity of different markets where countries like Europe uh, actually forgive the costs of their health benefits and retirement benefits as a cost of production amounting to several thousand dollars a year when they export a car to the United States, for example. When we send a car over there, they add that tariff on. And that's why when you go to Europe and you look around their markets, I was actually surprised. Only 10% of what's on the street over there comes from any other place in the world. They have a very regulated market, so you bring up a very good point. And we are one of the few countries in the world that doesn't have a value-added tax structure. Uh, there have been many bills over the years introduced to that effect. They've never made it through the Congress of the United States. But you have sort of ripped off the cover of a very thick book on how other countries behave versus the United States of America. It is a very... Uh, difficult marketplace for our producers. If you go to Japan, you will see that almost none of their cars, 2% of the cars on the street there, are from any other place in the world. And you go, oh, wait, what's going on here? And you uh, come to the United States, look, look in any parking lot. Which market is open? Which market is closed? So we haven't really addressed effectively in our trade policy the fact that though we are open there's a point at which a country could lose its spine its industrial spine and we are at that point with the steel industry in this country we can't afford to lose any more we can't be the victim of predatory pricing of the VAT tax that you talked about imposed by some of our closest allies from a political standpoint and that's what this struggle uh, with the steel industry is all about. Our guest serves the 9th District of Ohio. She is a member of the Appropriations Committee, and you are about to break a record next <laughs> week. What is that? Yeah. Well, uh, God willing, um, I will become the longest uh, serving woman uh, in the history of our country in the U.S. House of Representatives. And the people of our region have sent me here to do a job. I never knew how long it would take to affect change. 
I thought it would be much easier. I always use as the example the bill uh, that I introduced uh, early on in my career to create the World War II Memorial, which was something the American people wanted. You'd think we'd have that done in maybe five years. It took us 17 years. This issue of trade I've been fighting on since my, it was one of the issues in my first election going way back. I thought we would have had balanced trade accounts. And it's like, wait, wait a minute. Uh, this can't continue. And our region, what drove me to public life was the number of people who lost work in my area. It was just cataclysmic. How has Congress changed, particularly for women, during your tenure? It's been wonderful. Uh, we actually, the American people are making Congress more representative. If it weren't for gerrymandering, we would really be representative as a Congress. But we've quadrupled the number of women. Uh, when I got here, there were about two dozen, and now we have over a hundred. So it's quadrupled in a very short period of time, just since the late uh, 1980s until now. We have many more women running around the country. And uh, so this is a, I always point to the Statue of Freedom uh, atop the Capitol Dome I can see outside your window. And uh, the Statue of Freedom uh, faces east. Uh, she's smiling and she's a woman. Uh, we've seen Congress, particularly on the House side and Senate side, take action since the Me Too movement. For as short as it's been, are you seeing any significant change when it comes to how women are treated on Capitol Hill? Uh, I think that there really is a, a much greater consciousness of uh, behavior, although you can see we've got some uh, clinkers in the, uh, under the hood there. And um, in the end, um, I think justice will out and we will set standards. We will have um, a standard of conduct uh, that will apply uh, across the institution and the ethics committee has been working very, very hard on that and I support them in those efforts. Uh, Steve is next and Steve is from Indiana on our line for Democrats for our guests. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, I think there ought to be a lot more women, maybe a couple more hundred in the <laughs> Congress and stuff, and maybe they can get something done right. Uh, on the free trade and stuff and tariffs, uh, I think it's great that, you know, they might get a little bit back from the tariffs, but uh, I don't think it's going to matter because in October or November around there, the stock market's probably going to crash because of this. Uh, tax break that they're giving us. Okay, caller, thanks. Thank you, sir. The the um, uh, the stock market right now is fairly happy. Yes, there are daily aberrations, but the amount of money that actually went with the tax bill to the very largest corporations will mean that they will give stock uh, buybacks, uh, dividends to their shareholders, and higher salaries to their executives. They're already doing that. You can read about it in the newspaper. I think they will also probably acquire a lot more companies. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that workers will earn a living wage across this country. I think it was a very unbalanced bill. I think it was well-intentioned to try to create economic growth, but in the way that it was handled, uh, inside the Congress. It really didn't give the American people the best bill uh, so that our middle class would grow and would benefit from the kind of debt that this particular bill uh, created. And uh, so we have a lot of repair work to do uh, as a result. I do want to thank him. I do agree that the country should become more representative. I just want to say that um, uh, the women that serve, we work on a bipartisan basis. I was just in a meeting the other day dealing with the opioid uh, heroin crisis across this country. And women county commissioners were in here from around the country. They were so articulate. And we have Susan Brooks and uh, Lois Frankel, uh, a Republican and a Democrat, who, who co-chair that effort. They work so hard behind the scenes. They don't get much credit for what they do. But I really do see... Uh, the layers of America being more represented in the Congress by the representation of women. And personally, let me just say that I am one of the few that has ever been elected from the working class of people. And uh, I am very conscious of the voices that I am to represent here and their life experience. And I'm very grateful to the people of the 9th District for giving me that opportunity. Representative Marcy Kaptur, Democrat of Ohio, serves the 9th District. Thanks for your time. 
Thank you very much. We will have a conversation with Republican Congressman Jody Arrington of Texas next among the topics, his uh, take on the debate over tariffs and the budget process and if it can be fixed. That conversation coming up.